Hello everyone and welcome to Starship Simulator, a tech demo, and this is a work in progress alpha build 0.224.0.29 according to the corner there. It is built on Unreal Engine and I found out about it because of an Obsidian Ants video about it about four months back and I downloaded it then but I haven't tried it out yet so I decided I would try it out now just to see. Uh, I, I expect until it becomes more than a tech demo that uh, I'll just do a quick video on it to make people aware of it and uh, see what it's all about. I don't know if anything has changed about it since uh, Obsidian Ants video because uh, it is a tech demo. It could be a static thing as opposed to uh, early access which would have it continually update releases now. The way the cursor is going on, I'm wondering whether it's picking up my uh, other controls at all and whether that would confuse it. But the cursor sort of disappears very, very quickly. You see that? Uh, so that's why I'm a little bit confused there. Uh, maybe I should just do, with, do the training modules. Pending. Well, I guess. Bridge, scanning, and navigation. Okay. Loading Magellan class. So, a few decks. Of course, this is a game that I would like to have. Uh, it's, uh, exploring places with a starship is sort of the sci-fi thing to do, and this is a very, very, very Star Trek starship. My name is Ava. So, I'm Ava is our AI voice, voice assistant. In this module, Heck, maybe they could implement AI and have Ava be actually an AI. Well, apparently that's what I look like. To, the desired location. to begin, proceed to the ship's bridge. I have placed okay, some we've got waypoints, way. and I didn't have to press open. Uh, interesting, interesting choice of paneling, I'd have to say. I wouldn't recommend this on an actual starship, just because it's sort of creepy in a way. Like this stuff bulging out at yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, look, space is space Welcome is a place where horror horrors await sometimes. Control over any ship system. Right now, we're interested in the sensors, so make your way over to that console and take a seat. I'm sorry if her voice is a little bit soft. Uh, it's the music was very loud. Maybe. Oh, customize. Well, we can do. About star systems uh, uh, yeah. a 50 light year radius Maybe I should ships. disconnect like everything else. The star system mode uses the short range sensors. Okay, she. Uh, one thing for the tutorial, you need to let us press spacebar or something to confirm that we go understood ahead and press stuff. That button now. Don't don't have it automatically go ahead so much. I don't even know what button I'm supposed to press, but sometimes we are busy doing other things. Uh, like talking to an audience. So, apparently we can change our appearance. But the way my cursor is working right now, let me try and zero these out, maybe... Uh, okay, that... Uh, oh no, that only helped a little bit. Uh, okay, so, let's see. New recruit. Well, hold on. Hope this won't confuse it any. Um, that's a limited choice of countries game. What is this? I'm a, I'm sorry, but do brown people are not they are they not allowed in space? There's no China. China is about as likely as anybody else, I suppose. Uh, India's got a space program actually. But okay. Um, there are a lot of countries I understand, but having the most populous ones might be a thing. Uh, so. Command, why not? Fine, I'm captain. Uh, otherwise, there's not too much customization, I guess. There's a f just the default preset for space. Okay. F4, what does that tell me? Sensor station and press stellar region. I guess that might be the thing. Okay. Sensors. Okay, this is the one. And this, oh, well, the F4 said stellar region, but this one is blinking star system. The range controls allow you to fine tune the display range of the sensors, which makes it easier to focus on particular objects of interest or to gain a high level overview of the current star system. The central panel lists all of the valid objects in range, which you can click on to select as a target. Go ahead. You'll notice that the target information panel displays more detailed information about your selected target. Once you are happy with your selection, 
press the send to helm button to make the target coordinates available to the helm console for navigation. Ah, uh, I always go to Mars. Let's go to Saturn. Now head over to the helm console and take a seat. From here, we will navigate the ship to your chosen target. Okay, F is to get in and out of the seats. Let's begin by taking a quick look at the various screens available to the helm. The left-hand display is dedicated to navigation and shows both the ship's current galactic position along with its target destination coordinates. The central display deals with the flight controls themselves, including the FTL system, sublight engines, and reaction control thrusters. The right-hand screen features the autopilot controls, toggles for the 3D target indicators, and the ship's navigation lights. OK, let's retrieve the target information from the sensors by pressing the Use Sensor Target Use button. Use Sensor Target. Your target coordinates should now be displayed in this box, which represents your current nav target. Okay. The galactic coordinates represent the target's position in the galaxy to the nearest whole light year. The coordinates are relative to the center of our galaxy, the supermassive black hole um. known as Sagittarius A star. The local coordinates represent the target's position within a star system. The coordinates are relative to the system's center of gravity, which is usually a star, or the Berry Center in multi-star systems. While it is possible to fly the ship manually to any location in the galaxy, let's engage the autopilot for now, so that I can take care of that for you. Go ahead and press the highlighted button on the right-hand screen. The ship will now automatically turn to face Fast the one gas giant. Target, but you will need to manually engage the FTL system in order for us to get underway. You can now we're engage we're the orienting FTL through Earth. I, I haven't had a good time doing that. While the autopilot is engaged, I will manage the uh, ship's speed and final oh. approach to the target coordinates. Oh no! So just sit back oh. and enjoy the ride. Okay, the apparently FTL that's okay in this universe. By compressing space ahead of the ship, and then expanding it behind, creating a bubble of warped space with the ship at its center. The compressed space amplifies the ship's current velocity. Series by going by. The FTL field strength, so the ship's sublight engines are still used to provide the required thrust. The maximum speed of the ship is therefore a combination of the FTL field strength and the thrust output of the sublight engines. For the Magellan class. This is approximately 300 light years per hour. 300 light years per hour, well. Now that we've seen what the ship can do over a relatively short distance, let's pick a target that's much further away. This time we're going to use the long range sensors. Go ahead and press the stellar region button to view our local stellar neighborhood. As before, you can use the display range buttons to increase or reduce the number of displayed objects. No, depending that's fine. On your needs. Wolf 359. If you click between a few of the objects in range, You'll no. notice that none of them have any detailed information yet. Okay. This is because a sensor scan is required. Let's take a closer look at... You'll notice that the target information panel now gives us a high-level overview of the targeted system, including important data points, such as the extent of the habitable zone. This information can be used to determine if a star system is worth closer inspection. For example, if a planet exists in the habitable zone, you'll need to use the short-range sensors from within the system itself to determine if that planet can truly support life. Select one of the planets in the system that you'd like to take a closer uh, look at, and then press Center Health. In the system? Before. Uh... Oh, okay. So... You have to pick one of the planets. Well, I mean, Wolf 359 does not have good planets, let's face it. Now return to the helm console and take a seat once again. It's significant for other reasons. And now, engage the FTL system so we can get on. At least we're not going through Saturn. Oh, that's a little bit iffy. Okay, engage FTL. Our previous journey was merely interplanetary, but we're now leaving the Sol system behind and entering interstellar space. At our maximum speed of 300 light years per hour, it will still take over two full weeks to fly from one side of the galaxy to the other. That's a distance in excess of 100,000 light years. Our galaxy contains hundreds of billions of star systems that are waiting to be explored, in addition to countless other stellar phenomena that we don't even have names for yet. This ship and her crew are tasked with exploring Mission distant time like worlds, that, huh? seeking out new life in all of its diversity, and making peaceful first New life? I, I'm looking forward to actual other creatures. Let me just take a look around. 
Well, that's a better view behind us. Are we there yet? <laughs> ah, bright for an M class. Okay. Also pretty bright over here. Mercury is like just gray. So. Okay, here we are. You are okay. free to continue exploring if you wish. But please be aware that your progress will not be saved. Thank you, and goodbye. All right. Well. Yeah, there's something weird going on here. A 0 one control. Maybe I should set it to 50. That isn't helping. Okay, now I can use my arrow keys here, though. But it's weird a bit. Okay, main menu. Let's do the other training module. Cold start sequence. Okay, Welcome well, it's cold Magellan start, cold so start we have to have a... Module. My Flashlight. name is Ava. I'm the UN Space Fleet's AI voice assistant. In this module, Apparently we will the on. procedure for starting up the ship's fusion. Our first task is to provide Reactor. power to the engineering decks. So let's make our way to the start capacitor's room. Follow the waypoints on your HUD to the startup distributor. I may need waypoints every single time I do this. <laughs> but, okay. As its name suggests, the startup distributor routes energy from the start capacitors to the engineering decks and also provides the reactor with the power it needs to create the initial fusion reaction. You'll notice the device is already powered because the start capacitors are fully charged. Let's go ahead and get some I want to flick on a battery, darn it. Breakers. Start with the G-deck breakers, as in... I guess G-deck is more important for engineering, right? And now the F-deck breakers. I guess A deck is the top, the, the bridge or something, itself. maybe. Okay. So, startup supply, they're, they're distributed like that. Excellent. Okay, reactor supply. Doing. You can go ahead and turn off your torch by pressing T. The T. reactor controls should T now be for online. torch instead of so F let's for walk flashlight. Back to the reactor room and take a look. I guess that's the equivalent of starting up the battery. This console displays the reactor's vital information and provides you with full control over the reactor and its subsystems. On the left-hand side, we have the coolant section, which shows the liquid helium coolant flow and the condition of the magnetic field coils. On the right-hand side, we have the electrical section, which shows the reactor's main electrical bus, along with its input and output feeds. In the center, we have the reactor's main display, where we can control the fusion reaction itself. As you can see from all of these alarms, it would be impossible to initiate a stable fusion reaction under the current conditions, so let's fix that. The first thing we need to do is supply Press power startup. to the reactor's internal Maybe. bus, so go ahead and switch the reactor to startup mode. Great! Now that the reactor has power, we can activate the vacuum pump to start purging the confinement chamber. Okay, sounds the legit. The chamber pressure should now be dropping. To sustain a fusion reaction, we need an internal pressure of less than 10 nanopascals. While we wait for the confinement chamber to reach its target pressure, let's take care of the reactor's fuel and coolant supplies. Exit the reactor room via the door behind you and follow the waypoints on your HUD. These storage tanks hold all of the cryogenic fluids that are used to both fuel and cool the reactor. Okay. All four tanks are currently empty, so our first task is to begin the filling process. Let's start with the helium coolant. Head behind the storage tanks to access the helium cryo cooler. Behind? Oh. The cryo coolers use a process called Gosh. magnetic refrigeration. They're serious about their fusion into around cryogenic here. Cryogenic fluid before pumping it into the connected storage tank. Start up the helium cryo Excellent. Now if you turn around you'll find the helium refill valve located on the back wall. These valves control the flow of gases harvested by the ship's gas collection hardware, which is located on the underside of the forward hull. Helium. Okay, this one. If you turn around again and inspect the display screen connected to the helium tank, you should be able to confirm that the tank is now filling with fluid. We now need to perform the same... Yeah, with all the stuff I've pressed, 
things should have gone horribly Helium wrong by now. Is the first of two fuels used in the fusion reaction. As before, power up the device using its user interface. I already and have. Open the helium three refill valve behind you to start filling its associated tank. Okay. Next, we need to start filling the two deuterium tanks. So let's head over to the other side of the room. Deuterium, also known as heavy hydrogen, is the second of the two. Heavy hydrogen. Tanks. We store double the amount of deuterium compared to helium three because deuterium also fuels the reactor's neutral beam injectors. As before, turn on the first deuterium cryocooler. Okay. And now the first deuterium refill valve behind you. Okay. Next, turn on the second deuterium cryocooler. And now the second deuterium refill valve. Okay. Okay, perfect. All four storage tanks should now be filling with cryogenic fluids. For our next task, we now need to engage the cryo pumps in order to start supplying the reactor with everything it needs. Well, it is filling. Make your way around to the other side of the tanks and locate the deuterium tank outflow valve. So I'm not too sure about how these pipes work, but anyway. Open outflow the deuterium valve. outflow valve to begin supplying fluid to its connected cryo pump. I mean, Next, this. What the heck is going on here? Using the button indicated on its user interface. Excellent. That's half of the fuel mix taken care of. Now head over to the helium-3 tank outflow valve, so we can complete the fuel supply. As before, begin by opening the helium-3 outflow valve. Already did. Already did. <laughs> and now engage the helium-3 cryo pump. Perfect. Already did. <laughs> All we have to do now is take care of the coolant flow. Now open the Already helium did. outflow valve. And finally, power on the helium cryo pump. No apparent failures for doing all these the early. The reactor is now being supplied with all the fuel and coolant it needs. Follow the waypoints back to the reactor room, where we have just a few more valves to open. Seriously though, these pipes are messed up. To complete the coolant loop, open the helium inflow valve to Now make your way around to the opposite side of the reactor to complete the fuel supply process. First, open the deuterium inflow valve. Deuterium inflow and now valve. Open the helium three. Helium inflow three. Valve. Okay, great. Let's head over to the reactor controls and take a look at the coolant display. As you can see, we now have coolant flowing into the reactor. This has begun the process of cooling down the magnetic field coils, which must reach temperatures below 20 Kelvin in order to become superconductive. Okay. Once the coils have reached their target temperature, you will be able to engage the magnetic. 20 is field. fairly mild, actually. Okay, the temperatures look good. You can now power up the field coils. With a solid vacuum established, the field coils powered up, and fuel flowing into the reactor, you are now free to initiate the fusion reaction. Wait, that says high temp right there. Okay, now it doesn't. Maybe we should wait until that one doesn't say high temp in the future. Congratulations. Okay. You have now successfully started the fusion reactor. For safety, the reactor automatically starts up at only 10% of its rated power. Terminate. This means high voltage systems such as the FTL drive, will be underpowered until you increase the reactor output. Let's resolve that now. Increase the power level to 100%. You'll notice that you can increase the power beyond 100%, but doing so for an extended period will overheat the reactor, causing damage and forcing an uncontrolled shutdown. Okay, we now need to provide power to the rest of the ship. With okay. the reactor now powering itself, you can go ahead and switch the internal bus mode from startup to supply. Perfect. If we now head around to the opposite side of the reactor, the reactor output distribution I mean, that's a will be powered up. Good rendition of how a startup of a reactor ought to work, I guess. I mean, you're not gonna get this a better one in a game. The reactor's output to the ship's high voltage systems, which are in fact the only systems powered directly by the reactor. The rest of the ship is powered by 48 individual battery arrays, which we now need to begin charging using the reactor's output. Go ahead Battery and arrays all five even. of the output breakers here. Weapons. Excellent. If you turn to your left, you'll see the five high voltage distributors are now coming online. Uh oh. There's head more. Over to the main battery distributor. Main battery distributor. This device takes the high voltage reactor feed and distributes it to each of the eight battery rooms on F-Deck. Go ahead and connect all eight output breakers. 
Um, you don't want the external feed or emergency solar array. We've got an emergency solar array. Perfect. The battery arrays should now be charging, but we should perform a visual inspection to make sure. Follow the waypoints on your HUD to port We're battery. We're gonna visually remote. inspect the batteries. The electrical supply on Magellan-class starships is divided into four isolated quadrants. Forward, aft, port, and starboard. For increased redundancy, each quadrant is powered by two physically isolated battery rooms just like this one. Oh gosh. Should the battery arrays in one room cease to function for any reason, the arrays in the second room will continue providing power to that particular quadrant. Similarly, They're charging very, power very to slowly. one quadrant can be lost entirely without impacting the supply to the remaining three quadrants. Okay, let's take a look at one of the individual battery arrays. The time to depletion fluctuates quite a lot. On the left-hand side of the user interface, you have controls for managing the input and output breakers. And in the center, you have controls and information relating to this array's 10 solid-state battery cells. If we did everything correctly, all of the cells should now be slowly charging up. For the next step, we now need to connect each of the eight battery rooms to the ship's electrical grid. This task will take us into the ship's labyrinth of maintenance tunnels, so be sure to watch your head. Oh no! Follow the waypoints on your maintenance to tunnels. Battery aggregator one. Jeffrey's tubes or whatever. Or well, I guess this is a little bit roomier. Each battery room has a corresponding battery aggregator, just like this one. We have to do <laughs> these devices perform load oh boy. balancing. Well, I mean, each room starting up a starship should be complicated, but voltage. connecting all the batteries like this. Go ahead and connect the output. Okay. I guess One it's to uh, if uh, the starship is destroyed, Next, it allows it to be independent. So, I mean, uh, if parts are destroyed, then before, the other parts will still function. This output breaker. So I guess it makes that sense. That takes care of the port battery rooms. Let's make our way to the forward quadrant next. Go ahead and connect the output brake, and the same again on forward battery aggregator two. Okay. Okay, onwards to the starboard quadrant. Same again. Connect same again. And the second starboard aggregator. Almost done. Just the aft quadrant to go. Okay, we can crawl. I just press control and so Connect we can crawl through Jeffrey's tubes. We just haven't finally the second aft aggregator. Been asked to do Jeffrey's tubes yet. Okay, perfect. All 48 of the ship's battery arrays are now connected to the electrical grid. All we have to do now is supply power to the ship's remaining decks and then perform a few cleanup tasks. We can do most of that from the reactor room. Obviously, so this would be now. much better with Follow a full crew or anything or something like that. Distributor. This game was meant for having many people control the ship very clearly. Which would be nice. It would be nice. There's no telling how much work you'll get to fulfill the vision. Each deck in a given quadrant is fed by a deck distributor, which takes the total electrical load of that quadrant and then load balances it between the two connected batteries. It's moddable, then it'd be easier. And finally, the port deck distributor. Okay, all right. Most of the work's on the battery. The reactor is comparatively easy. Is that you? Each deck has four of these devices. Each One deck has four quadrant. of them. They are fed by the corresponding deck distributor. Each Go deck. Ahead and switch this quadrant over to the main battery feed. That's better. Now we can really see what we're doing. Now head over to the starboard quadrant distributor and do the same. Ah. Uh... <laughs> And now the aft quadrant distributor. There's just for one deck. And finally, the port quadrant distributor. That's G deck taken care of. 
Let's do I never want to leave G deck. <laughs> Head upstairs to the F deck forward quadrant distribute. Okay. As before, and now the same on the starboard quadrant distributor. It's a lot of decks to do this with. We haven't even gone to E deck. And again on the aft quadrant distributor. And finally, the port quadrant distributor. Well done. That's the main objectives of the cold start procedure complete. But we have one final bonus task. To bonus perform. task. Follow the waypoints on your HUD up to the bridge. Yeah, is the bridge we'll the powered? Fire. I thought it was very, uh, very high up. I mean, it's not F deck. Now E deck seems okay. It seems to have full power and everything. So it doesn't seem like we have to especially do these decks. But apparently bridge is separate. The lights and bridge systems are still turned off, so let's bring everything online. Head over to the A deck distributor in the engineering alcove. Maybe I should turn on my torch. Now go ahead and turn on the bridge lighting. Bridge lighting. And now power up the bridge systems. Okay, there we go. You have successfully started the fusion reactor. Well, Routing so A deck all of the ship's lighting and hardware was and here. the bridge online into a flight ready state. This concludes the Magellan So they they did some of the module. connections on Good their luck. own and I without hope telling me. me again in future training modules. I feel like this was an incomplete startup. There were uh, there were other startup things that they automatically did. So okay, Let, let's say. Uh oh. Uh, okay, what does customize? Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Cause what does customize ship? Do? Oh, that's just a registration and. Seasonal declarations is some well, okay coming soon just color stuff Color stuff. Well, I mean that's important. So particular Okay, well, let's see what start new mission is so Magellan class. Well, that's the one crew complement full crew flight ready Well, I think that's probably for the best, right? L let's see what it does. I I am still Tyler Reeves, yes. Well, not a full complement of crew here. Anybody wandering around? So not that kind of full complement. Okay, well this was the panel that we were supposed to use. Star system. Oh. Ooh. Star system. Okay. That's fine. Stellar region. Galactic re position is not a thing yet. Alright, so... Black hole, huh? Well, no black holes in sensor range, but go. I wanted to go to the Trappist system. Do you have it? Oh, that's only twenty light years. Uh, maybe I need another page. Here, I want fifty light years. Fifty. You're only giving me up to twenty light years. I don't think they've done. Maybe if we. Uh, confine it to M class. Okay, this there's more than twenty light years now. We just had a limit, but there's a lot of M classes. Trappist one is where it's uh, forty point six six light years away, so it should be within that display range, but. Um, it's not showing up. It is an M-Class. It's an M8V. It's got a lot of little planets around it. And I very much want to discover it. But, it doesn't look like we can do it this way. I need another way to find a star system. Like, I need to be able to tar uh, type in the star system or something. Search for it. Because this list doesn't go long enough to cover stuff that's more than 26 light years away. Hmm. Okay, well, so there goes that idea. No Trappist system for us. There's no O-class in this range. Sirius is an A-class, isn't it? Let me double check. Yeah, Sirius is an A-class. It's an A-0, but it's still an A. 
Uh, Vega is also an A. There, there really aren't any B classes close by. B classes would be very big. I guess they rounded up for A0. Oh, okay, let's go to Alpha Centauri, heck. Scan target. The G class star. That's uh, got some terrestrial planets. Let's go for the one in 1.05 AU. That should be good. Send to helm. Okay, use sensor target. And engage auto navigation. The overflow on that is uh, where it says silicate terrestrial planet is not great, but okay. I guess engage. Okay, we're moving towards it. They didn't tell me about external viewer stuff. Mouse wheel, camera distance in third person, C is cycle the uh, modes. Okay, well there I'm looking very Star Trek-y. Got white hair though, but that that's it. But And then I zoom out and that's the limit. Is there a ship view? No, I don't see a ship view. Probably ought to be one. Oh, uh, we can do better shadow resolution. Uh oh. It's a lot of AUs overlapping. I'm not sure, but uh, I think maybe the tech demo is static. Because I, I don't think things are too different from what I remember from from Obsidian Ants video. Well, we have presumably arrived. Whoop. And what those lights are. Just reflections of the interior. We need a forward view port that can give me a better view of the planet. But right now it's dark. Maybe, is there a way to navigate to the daylight side of it? Hmm. Well, let me see, maybe the helm can do something about this. Pitch down. Well, we can sort of... Can I use my joystick? No. Yaw left. Okay, we can do that. And it auto stabilizes. Let me yaw left a little more. We're going 30 kilometers per second, it says there. Orbital speed around this planet should not be that much different from Earth. Well, increasing the field power has not done anything. 1.21 gigawatts, huh? <laughs> okay. So we can rotate, but uh, as far as going forward and back, I'm not sure. Interesting, the data entry has A, B, C, D, E, and E, F, and G, like the DEX, but it doesn't have other letters for data entry. Can I engage just a little bit of FTL here? Well, that doesn't seem to be doing anything. I want to go in this direction, that's all. I think it's... let me... I haven't engaged that. I don't need to disengage. The auto navigation should be off. Oh, but we are sort of getting more sunlight over here. Maybe if I go... oh, now, now the speed has changed. 195 kilometers per second. Okay, now we're moving. Okay, so there is manual navigation potential. It's not super faster than light here. <laughs> um, this, if 11% gets us to 195, hopefully it's... Well, it is uh, because it's... It scales non-linearly. What it is, is anything less than 10% just leaves us with 30 kilometers per second. 10% gets us to 75. Okay, now we can see more of the surface. We're pretty close in.
They don't do orbits per se. Or every orbit is assumed to be 30 kilometers per second, I'm not sure. Anyway, we get a better view of this particular planet around Alpha Centauri, and I'll be satisfied with that for now. It looks very Marsy. Looks very Marsy. Okay. But yeah, this is a tech demo. It's got some things going for it, but uh, to actually bring about the vision of what it's trying to do is a lot of work. So, alright. With that conclusion, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.